Matthew 28. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, which would be Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. Now you remember that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary saw Joseph who took the body of Christ wrapped in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own tomb which had been hewn out of a rock and he rolled a large stone in front of it, the entrance of the tomb, and, and then he went away and Mary Magdalene was there. You see that at the first part of verse 57 and following. So they knew where the tomb was and on Sunday morning after they had celebrated the Sabbath, they went back to the grave. Verse 2, And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And at his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. Well, the guards that were there shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, Don't be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He's not here because he has risen. Just as he said, Come, see the place where he was lying. And go quickly now and tell the disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report to the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they came up and took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and they will see me. Now while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. Now it's said that a picture is worth a thousand words, but I've found that people love stories. Did you know that 40% of the Old Testament is written in the narrative? And a large part of the New Testament is also written in a narrative. All four Gospels are in the narrative format. God, as our Creator, knows that we all love to hear stories. We insert ourselves into the stories that we hear. In fact, as I read that story, I wonder if you weren't thinking what it must have been like to be those women at that grave. Or maybe you're thinking what it was like to be that guard or those guards that saw the angel descend in the earthquake. We insert ourselves into the stories. And we easily recall a storyline. If not every detail, we get the gist of things when we hear it in a narrative. Today, on this momentous day, the most momentous day in the church calendar, even greater than Christmas, which celebrates the birth of Christ. On Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate the culmination of Christ's first advent. He completed his work, his substitutionary death on the cross, and that's a big word, substitutionary. It means that he became our substitute. He died on the cross for you and for me. Okay, that's what it means, substitutionary death. He was our substitute. He received all the wrath of God for my sin on the cross. And then he was buried, securing the fact that he truly died a physical death. It was not just a swoon. It was not a fake death. He didn't just pass out on the cross. He died and was buried on the cross, uh, on, in, on, in a grave. And then the earth-shattering news on the third day that he arose from the dead to live forever. The entire story is wrapped up in our celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
This is a story, but it is a true story. It actually took place. Now, I've preached a lot of sermons on Resurrection Sundays, and many of them have focused on the theological implications, and they've stressed the doctrine of the resurrection. And I want to say doctrine and theology are vital because the resurrection validates Christ's sacrificial death and advances the whole program of the kingdom with an eternally living king. He sits right now at the right hand of the Father, our righteousness. He is in a glorified body, the same body that appeared to the disciples, seated at the right hand of the Father, presently. He's an eternally living king. And the resurrection must be believed in order for someone to experience salvation according to Romans 10, 9, and 10. You need to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died and was risen from the dead. Objective truth when dealing with biblical teaching is of the utmost importance. Truth that stands outside of individuals' opinions and feelings. But... But there is also a subjective side to the resurrection people, as there is to all truth, actually. There is propositional, objective truth, and we can never lay that aside. But there is also the response to that truth, which is often very subjective. We should never forget that Jesus' resurrection rocked the world of his disciples. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Have you had someone close to you pass away? Most of us have. Could you imagine three days later seeing them alive? We should never forget that Jesus' resurrection rocked their world. The small, tight-knit group of women who followed Jesus from Galilee. His chosen disciples, as well as over 500 who witnessed him, alive and well, ascending up into heaven. No small thing here. Not just a couple of people telling a fib. 500 or more people. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we contemplate the words of Matthew 28, and we confess to you that in our hubbub, fast-paced 21st century, with all the social media going around and everything happening, and the best we can do with memes, he has risen... Lord, the truth of these verses is hard to pull in and it's hard for us to sit quietly for a moment to meditate upon them and think of the implications. Well, I pray today, Lord, that through this sermon we will do just that, that we'll just take time out. If our phones are on, that we'll shut them down, Lord, so that we're not getting texts. Father, that we can just concentrate on this story, a narrative of what truly happened over 2,000 years ago in the life of Jesus Christ and his followers. That you'd open our eyes, that we might be able to behold these things in a fresh and new way, and that they will impact us. Father, not only that we will accept as truth, objective truth, the facts of this account but, Father, that they would affect us subjectively, that we would feel something, that we would be moved in our affections for Christ because he does live. And he has forgiven our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning I'd just like to talk to you about objective truth a little bit because we can't ever lay aside truth and propositional statements, doctrine, to go over here and just have warm, fuzzy feelings. Sadly, some have done that. They're just big on the truth part. (laughs) Just as sadly, maybe more so, are those that are just on the warm fuzzies because they don't even base those things on the truth. It's what they feel. And you you do realize, don't you? You do realize that our entire generation, this, this generation, is completely consumed by the way we feel. Most of the things that we do in our lives are based on what we feel like. 
Can I just propose to you that that is really, really bad? But I do want to talk about the objective truth. I want to talk about subjective responses to that objective truth, and then I'm going to wrap it all up with a personal account of the reaction to the resurrection. And so that's our little outline. I don't think it got in the bulletin. Did it? Did it get in the bulletin? Because I was struggling what to preach So late in the week. I mean, it's another one of those days. It's like, oh my gosh, where do you go? So the first point would be the objective truth of the resurrection. Let's, let's look at this a little bit. The theological implications of the resurrection. And I just want to tell you three things. Number one, it ensures our justification. Oh, justification. That's almost like substitutionary. <laughs> justification means that God has declared some righteous. It's like God is a judge, which he is, and because of Jesus' substitutionary atonement on the cross, if we as a sinner believe that Jesus died for our sins, then God looks down on us and declares us righteous. We're not righteous in ourselves at all. We're sinners. But we're saved by grace. And we are saved and justified by the proclamation of the Father of God based on Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, which the sinner has now embraced and believed for their own salvation and forgiveness of their sins. And so God says, you're justified. It's, it's a righteousness that's outside of ourself. Luther called it an alien righteousness. Way before they were talking about aliens. It's outside of us, okay? And the resurrection ensures our justification. Why do I say that? Well, justification, the act of God declaring us to be righteous, not guilty any longer before God, just like a judge might say to somebody in the docket that's before him for a crime, you're free. You're not guilty. It's a not guilty declaration. When God does that, it's crystal clear in Paul's words from Romans 4.25 where he says this, He, Jesus, was delivered over, which means he was put to death, because of our transgressions. He died because we sin. Okay? And then it goes on to say, and was raised because of our justification. So Christ's resurrection has a big part in our justification. He's raised because of our justification. When Jesus was raised from the dead, it was God's declaration of approval on Christ's work of redemption on the cross. He says, good job, this is done. Everything that you have done, it's done. No more needed. He was saying by the resurrection, your work is complete, Jesus. And Jesus said it himself on the cross. It is finished. Okay? So I always like to say from this pulpit, Quit trying to save yourselves. Quit trying to be good enough because that won't work. It just won't work. Because you could never be good enough to be justified or declared righteous. Aw. Doesn't bother me a whit, believe me. The rest of them could go off and I'd just keep preaching. There's no more penalty for the sin. There's no more wrath of God to bear. There's no more guilt or liability to punishment because it's all been completely paid for. It's finished. Now, do you understand the implications of just that? Because we all try to be good, don't we? We all want to be good. And we all fail every single day. We blow our own expectations. How about God's level of expectation for righteousness. We are so far gone, folks. Were it not for being declared righteous, we're forever lost. Okay? There is no reason for Jesus to remain dead any longer. He completed everything, so God raised him from the dead. And if God <laughs> raised him from the dead, he raised us up with him too. Now you say, well, okay, whoa, wait a second, that's a leap of logic. No, it's not. 
because we're dealing with propositional truth here. In Ephesians 2.6, it says, by virtue of God's declaration of approval of Christ, he also declared that approval of us, and we are in Christ. Our union with Christ includes not only his death unto sin, but his resurrection. Read Romans chapter 6. Rock your world. If you believe what Romans chapter 6 says, you will walk away with such a smile you won't be able to stop smiling. That's propositional truth. This is, this is objective truth. This is outside of ourselves. This is written to us by God and doesn't have anything to do with us except that we receive it. Secondly, the resurrection ensures regeneration. Did you know that? It ensures regeneration. 1 Peter 1.3 says, quote, We have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our regeneration, that whole born-again thing, that many people don't understand, it's from John chapter 3, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Nicodemus didn't understand. He said, how can I go back into my mother's womb? Jesus said, oh. I mean, the Jews were forever and a day taking Jesus literal when he was using metaphors and trying to help them to understand things. And Jesus was amazed. He says, how can a teacher of Israel think like this? But they did. Now, rebirth, being born anew to a living hope. Okay, Hope. Why would we have hope? Well, we don't have to pay for our sins. Our sins are all paid for. It is finished, remember? So there is hope now in our heart. It springs up in our heart. And there's hope And in the biblical sense of the word, hope, it means a a, a solid expectation of something to come. We expect to be with Christ someday. So we have this a renewed hope, a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. When Jesus rose from the dead, he had a new quality of life, people. That physical body, That physical body of his was actually killed and it died and it rose again in new life. He became Jesus Christ, the risen Savior. He experienced resurrection life. His physical body and human spirit were perfectly suited for fellowship and obedience to God forever and ever. While we remain on this earth, our physical bodies... We do not receive all the blessings won for us through Christ's resurrection because we're still in our physical bodies. These things haven't died yet. This thing is a house of sin. Romans teaches us, Paul's teaching, that sin dwells within us. He says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Okay, So we not only get tempted by the devil, we not only get tempted by the world, we also get tempted by the sin that dwells within us, right from inside of us. We've got a problem. We're declared righteous. It's not our righteousness. Our righteousness is seated at the right hand of the Father. And yet, God sees us as being righteous, and yet we sin. But, if we have been born again, if we, as Peter says, are born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, we can rest assured that even though we live in this sin-cursed body, in a sin-cursed world, that's going to change someday. Ephesians 2 says that God made us alive together with Christ. We have Zoe. We have life, and it's new life. Before we believed, we had bios. That's physical life. But we had no spiritual life. We didn't have zoe because, do you know why? We were dead in trespasses and sins. But now, because of Christ's resurrection, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved, and he's raised us up with him. <laughs> When Jesus said, it is finished, he meant a lot. Okay? Because I'm looking out at you, and I know some of you are definitely believers, and you know what? It's done, folks. You 
are not only on the escalator going up, you already arrived in God's eyes. He already sees you as settled and glorified. Because you're in Christ. You're in Christ Jesus. This is such good news. Because of His resurrection, we have the resurrection of life. Life that provides the power to live godly. You say, man, I just keep sinning and sinning. Join the crew, okay? We are sinners. And every time you sin, it should make you run to the cross and go, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for dying for me. Because this sin is what you died for. And you paid for it. Thank you. And so therefore, your sin doesn't defeat you. It brings you into victory because you point it to the cross. You say, thank you, Jesus. Do you realize in Ephesians 1, in Paul's prayer, he prayed for the Ephesians that you might know the greatness of his power. We're talking about power here now. Toward us who believe. That means everybody who believes, the Ephesian believers. That, that these are in accordance. This power is in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. I mean, he, he piles words together here. Uh, uh, brought unto the working of the strength of his might and his power, which he brought about in Christ. When did he do that? When he raised him from the dead. Paul prayed that the Ephesian believers, and us by extension, would know the power of his resurrection. Do we know it? Are we living in it? Well, his resurrection ensures regeneration. We were raised together with him. And thirdly, it ensures glorified bodies. It ensures resurrection bodies for us who believe. Who believe. Now this is theology we can really get excited about. Maybe this is part of the being born anew to a living hope that Peter talked about because the resurrection of Jesus Christ ensures that someday every believer will enjoy a resurrection body. Okay, It's not going to wear down like our bodies wear down. It's not going to hurt and ache like our bodies hurt and ache. No matter how much exercise you do. 1 Corinthians 6.14 says this, quote, And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. Amen. And again in 2 Corinthians 4.14 he says, He who raised the Lord will raise us also with Jesus and brings us with you into His presence. Because He raised, we raise. And we will be in His presence. I tell you what, you cannot go into the presence of God in these bodies. So you either have to die, in which case your body would be transformed, or you are raptured off the earth when Christ returns if you're still alive because this body, the beachhead of sin, needs to be changed somehow. It needs to become like Jesus' body that was resurrected. When Paul's teaching on 1 Corinthians 15, he refers to Jesus' resurrection as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. I read that. As the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Just as a ripe fruit of a crop is an indication of what the rest of the crop will produce, so Jesus' resurrection and his resurrection body is the first instance of such a body and indicative of what our resurrection bodies will be like. Now there are some, like Enoch, who did not die. In the Old Testament, he just was no more. <laughs> I love that. Which means God took him up. But he wasn't in his resurrected body. He didn't walk on the earth in his resurrected body. Jesus Christ is the only one that actually walked in his resurrection body. Remember what he said to Thomas? Come, come here, Thomas. Oh, man. Don't want to be Thomas. Come here, Thomas. Here, put your hand in these wounds. Here, take. Here, 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 Thomas. Put, put your hand right in here. It's me. Jesus. The one you saw crucified. Oh. <laughs> I'm hedging towards the subjective aspects of resurrection, right? Thomas is like melting right there before him. Can you imagine that? This stuff happened, people. It actually happened. Now listen to this, because this is beautiful, from 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, that means believers. Now we are the children of God. 
Because as many as received him, he gave them power to become the children of God. And it has not yet appeared what we will be. Okay? So that tells there's something more to come. We know. Oh, I love that. We know. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. We know that when he appears, when he comes back a second time, we will be like him. We'll be like him. Why? Because we'll see him just as he is. It's all about the resurrection body. We're guaranteed a resurrection body because of Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. Okay? So that, that's three things. It ensures our justification, ensures our regeneration, that's new birth, and it, re- and, and it ensures a future resurrection body. Okay? Enough of the objective truth. Let's move to the fun, feely things. Okay? Second point, the subjective responses to the resurrection. You can stay in Matthew 28 and just kind of look through these as I talk about it. But as I said at the beginning of the sermon, this is the greatest day in the calendar of the church. It's also the most emotional packed story in the Bible. The truth of it brings the greatest personal impact on everyone who believes it. Because those who hear and believe accept the propositional truth that Jesus Christ died for them personally. You see, it's not a cultural thing. I don't care if your mommy and daddy were were believers. That doesn't touch you. It may enable you to hear the truth more readily, but it doesn't save you. You must believe independent of everyone else. When you stand before God, you will stand before Him individually and he will either be your judge or he will be your savior because those who hear and believe have received him personally a payment satisfying the wrath of God and he's then secured the forgiveness for all their sins it's all validated by his resurrection it's God's stamp of approval that what he did was acceptable This conversion from being under the wrath of God to becoming one of his children, forgiven and redeemed, is what the gospel is all about. It's the basis of Christianity. It doesn't have anything to do with going to church. It doesn't have anything to do with becoming a member. It doesn't have anything to do with being confirmed or anything else like that. It's got everything to do with your heart bowing before the Lord Jesus Christ saying, I'm a sinner, forgive me, forgive me. And then thank you. (laughs) It's the only response. That's all we have to do. The only thing we add to our salvation, the only way we're participatory in our salvation is the sins which we committed that caused us to need to be saved. And then we say thank you after we've received that forgiveness. Not much. It's all done for us. Such welcome news was received at the time of the resurrection, not only as objectively true, but with great emotion, people. There was so much emotion. The first gospel describes the resurrection as we enter the garden where Jesus was buried, and Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave of Jesus. And the first thing that we hear about is a massive earthquake. It came as an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and it was all more than the guards protecting the tomb could handle. Talk about blown minds. These guys just dropped dead right there and then. Or they acted like it. Notice the words used to describe the guards' response, and let's get subjective here, okay? In verse, and in verse 4 of chapter 28, Matthew 28, says, the guards shook for fear. They shook for fear of him and became like dead men. That's the angel that they saw that accompanied the earthquake. They shook for fear. Fear is fabas, dread, terror, a feeling of being unsettled, totally out of control. There's no control in this situation. They had none, and they were fearful. They didn't have a category to place this into. It says that they were like dead men, Necros, death, without life, inactive, without animation. Stunned? And the women that came along, you see this down in verses 8 and 9. They left the tomb quickly 
filled with fear and great joy, and they ran to report to his disciples. <laughs> this is so amazing. Fear is the same word. Here it's phobos. Okay, phobia. They were fearful. This was so otherworldly. This is so beyond the pale. They had no category, so they were fearful. But it also says they were filled with great joy. Megas karach. The joy was just seeping out of every pore of their body. Can it be? Even as they were fearful. Okay, think of a, a rubber band just stretched to its limits, okay? That's where these women were emotionally. Can you imagine? Do you think there were tears maybe? And they fell down at his feet and they worshipped him. Reverent homage causing them to absolutely fall at his feet. It's him. He's alive. Don't get it. Don't understand. I mean, in another place in the, in the Gospels, it says after the disciples saw Jesus alive, it says, but they did not yet understand what he said that he would raise from the dead. And they had already seen it and experienced him. They didn't understand. It's, it's beyond the pale here. And the women, if you turn over to Mark chapter 16, I hope you circle in your Bibles. I'm not doing it in this one. This is a pulpit Bible. That's clean. But I, I have all these words circled in my Bible. And in Mark 16, if you'd look at verse, um, verse 5, it's the same story, but it kind of continues on. Let's see, verse 5. Entering the tomb, this is, um, this is the... Okay, verse 4. Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, though it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right wearing a white robe, and they were amazed, and they said to him, this is the women again, they were amazed. Amazed. It's another word trying to carry the subjective response to the resurrection. To be amazed is linked to the verb trembled by the little conjunction. And it's another emotion that is they were astonished. It's a Greek word, ektasis. Ek means out from, and stasis means standing. It's the word from which we get our English word ecstasy. It means to be outside of the normal mundane mind, displaced from the ordinary. Someone who has a sudden emotion and is transported, as it were, clear out of themselves. They were in ecstasy, people at the resurrection. Their minds completely absorbed by things divine. These dear women were immediately drawn into a state of ec ecstatic wonderment with fear. <laughs> Rubber bands stretched to its lengths. Their emotions were shot. Astonished, verse 8, linked to the verb trembled by that little conjunction and and they were afraid. It means the same thing as we've seen before. Also in Mark 16, just following down into verse 10, we see that the women then went and reported to the disciples, right? Look at verse 10. She went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. They were mourning and weeping. Have you ever been into a house of mourning? See, it doesn't ring true here. Our, our, our gatherings that we have just isn't like the New Testament. They wail. They're like people without hope. Everything is gone and they just wail. And the weeping, that mourning is the grief over death, their lamentation, but that weeping is the end of the process. It's the result of deep grief over death. It's, 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 it's what's left over after the wailing and the crying out, they fall into a huddle of tears. And that's the way they found the disciples. And they share with them, when they heard, verse 11, and when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe her. They just flat out refused to believe her. Apasteo. 
Pisteo means to believe and have trust and confidence in. When you put a negative in front of it, apisteo, it means unbelief, disbelief. They could not believe her. So they ran, didn't they? They ran to check it out. (laughs) And I love it. Peter checks it out, and he comes out, and he goes home. Right? I mean, there are no words. It just says he goes home. (laughs) Amazing. Amazing. Finally, turn over to Luke 24. My favorite. My favorite passage. Believe me. This is just wonderful. These are two on Easter Sunday. Yes, I said Easter. Resurrection Sunday. Two followers of Jesus returning to their home of Emmaus. And they saw the resurrected Lord. Remember, he came up and started walking with them like out of the blue. He, he's just walking with them on the road. They don't know who it is. Their eyes were hold. They, they didn't understand it was Jesus. And he begins to talk to them. And he begins to show them everything from the Old Testament that was written about him. And he kind of takes them through a chronology of why he had to come, live a sin, sinless life, die on the cross, and be resurrected all from the Old Testament, he taught them. And their, their response is seen in verse 32. In verse 32, they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the Scriptures to us? Burning hearts, people. Burning hearts. Metaphorically, it shows a deep sense of understanding that comes from a a spiritual sense, the light that shows the way. It's used of how the disciples felt about John the Baptist's ministry. You don't hear a lot about John, but he was a preacher. And people followed him. He had a great following. He didn't just baptize people. He preached to them about righteousness. And in John 5.35 we read, He was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. As he taught, their hearts burned. And same with Jesus when he taught them. These two on the road to Emmaus felt that intense spiritual burning in their hearts as Jesus taught them. Okay. I don't want to give too much to the subjective feelings and emotions, but I don't want to give too much to the objective truth that can be cold and without feeling. I want to balance. I want to be right here in the pulpit. With those two at at both ends. But listen to me, people. If you don't have any affection for Jesus Christ, you're not saved. You're not saved. I don't care how long you've been coming to church. I don't care how many generations back your people have been Christians. If you do not have personal affection for Jesus Christ that you feel, you are not saved. How can you have all of your sins forgiven and not feel something? I'm not saying you have to weep great big crocodile tears when you got converted. I'm just saying there's got to be an overwhelming love that wells up in your heart for Christ. And yes, it wanes and it grows and it wanes and it grows because we're in these sin-cursed bodies living on a sin-cursed earth. But if there is no true affection in your heart for Jesus, don't fool yourselves. Don't fool yourselves. Now, I'd like to wrap up things by giving you a personal account of reaction to the resurrection. It's a real-life illustration of the power of the resurrection, and I'm I'm taking it from an eyewitness account. My eyes and my witness. I saw these things with my eyes. And because God blessed me with a first-hand account of the emotions of Easter, I want to bear witness to that. I want to testify to that this morning for you. The time was July 10th and 11th of 1987. This July would make it 31 years ago that this took place. The place was a remote island in eastern Indonesia called Taliabo. If you've been around me and Mary for any time at all, you've heard of Taliabo. How can you spend the better part of your adult life in a place and not hear about it, right? 
And the event was the preaching of the gospel to a previously unreached language group. Now, many people don't understand this in America, and it, it, it just absolutely slays me. <laughs> people will watch a Taliabo video, and they'll ask us, serious, serious, Scout's Honor, they'll ask us, how they spoke such good English. They don't understand it was a reenactment. These people didn't even speak the lingua franca of the country, Bahasa Indonesia. They had their own separate language. They were monolingual, meaning only one language, that language that they had, the Taliabo language, and it wasn't written. They were 100% illiterate, or we should say preliterate nowadays, right? Because we have to be nice. Or we could even go further and don't even bring literacy in it and just say they were an oral community, right? Whatever works for you, just understand these people were way back in the woods. They had never heard of the Bible, God, creation, or Jesus Christ. Not even a clue. And Mary and I had moved in to live among those people, and we lived there for four and a half years. We spent thousands of hours. I, I tallied them up. About 2,500 hours a year studying their language for four and a half years comes to about almost 10,000 hours of language study. We made a lot of close friends during that time because learning a language, you have to speak it with people, so we became friends with many people. And our entire rationale for being with these people was about to be realized on July 10th and 11th, 1987. Because we had gone to Indonesia to preach the gospel to people who had never heard the gospel before, and the Taliabo really fit that profile. They were the real deal. Six months earlier, we had begun to lay the foundation for the gospel. We began teaching twice a week about creation from the book of Genesis, and then we painstakingly followed through the Old Testament narratives and established in their minds the character and nature of God. Who God is, according to the Bible. And they came to understand that people are sinful and that their own lives affirm that truth on a daily basis. We didn't have to beat that into their heads. They knew they were sinners. And all through the months of arduous teaching, we instilled within their hearts and minds that God was a sovereign creator. He is over all. And not only a just and a holy lawgiver, he gave the Ten Commandments, but a merciful and loving creator. And a holy, holy God. And all who violated his law would suffer punishment. But we also taught them that he was a faithful promise keeper. And that he promised to send a deliverer. In Genesis 3.15, right at the beginning right at the fall. And so over the previous six months of teaching the people, they were always looking for that promised deliverer, that promised one. In every story that we would tell, every lesson that we gave over a six-month period, they were looking for a promised deliverer. They clearly understood that they were accountable to the holy and just God, and God would judge them, but they also were aware that all through the Old Testament, God made ways of escape from his judgment if they just believed that he would honor his word. And so they looked for the promised one for them so they could escape the judgment that they were sensing they were under. Imagine the overwhelming sense of joy, okay, a feeling. Imagine the overwhelming sense of joy that they experienced when they listened to the words of John the Baptist heralding Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. They knew all about the sacrificial system. They knew all about the Lamb of God that the Jews would sacrifice in order to cover their sins and make an atonement for their sins. And now this one, this person, Jesus, is the Lamb of God that's going to take away the sins of the world. Immediately, they're, they're not stupid. They immediately identify, that's the one, that's him. This is the one we've been waiting for. From that moment on, they listened intently as we explained the life of Jesus, all the incredible miracles that he performed, and honestly, they fell in love with him. Affection, affection for Jesus Christ. 
They loved him. And they put their hope in him. And although they did not quite understand how he would provide their way of escape from the judgment of God, they loved him. Now as the weeks went on and we continued to teach, we came to the Passion Week, the last week in the life of Jesus Christ. They were exuberant to see his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. (laughs) They were identifying with the crowd. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And the people identified him. He's the promised one, isn't he? He's been sent by God to deliver people from sin. The jubilation changed Friday, July 10th. When we told them of Judah's betrayal of Jesus, of his arrest in the garden, how horribly the soldiers treated him, mocking him, whipping him, even plucking the hair of his beard from his face. They were beginning to experience some of the emotions that the remnant of faithful Jews Even his own disciples felt as they saw all these things taking place. The Taliabu were inserting themselves into that story. One lady banging, saying, I hate those soldiers! I hate those soldiers! They were there, people. They were there. The Taliabu were seeing this for the very first time. They'd never heard this before. And this is the promised one. They had no idea it would turn how it would turn out, and none whatsoever. And, and so they hung on every word as we were teaching this. And we taught them of Christ's death on the cross and recounted the last seven words of Christ on the cross, finishing with the words that he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And we stopped. That was the end of the teaching for that day. Completely silent. On a bamboo platform, over 200 people sat in absolute silence. We asked them not to come over to our houses like they typically did to discuss the lessons after the lesson was done. We said, tonight we just want you to go home and want you to think about what you've just heard. And many sat with their heads in their hands. They just didn't know what to do. And others got up and slowly began to make their ways back to their houses and no one was speaking. We didn't tell them not to speak. Nobody was speaking. Just a sort of shuffling off into the village and into the night. Well, like Mary Magdalene and the women, we were up at the crack of dawn, the missionaries. And I was reading over the lesson that we were going to teach the people that day and we prayed and I read over the material again and we prayed again and I read over the material again and our stomachs were in knots with anticipation. What would God do with these people? We didn't know how they would respond. How would they receive the message of resurrection? Did we use just the right taliabo words to communicate this most important of all messages that we had so far given to the taliabo? We prayed again and then we left for the meeting house. When we got there, it was somber. They still weren't talking. Everybody had come. But they were still absolutely quiet. Like the disciples of old, there was weeping and there was mourning. And I'm certain there was a lot of confusion in their hearts and minds. And they knew that Jesus was the Son of God, the promised one, the Lamb of God, who is to take away the sin of the world. But as the old faithful tribal man said as we left the meeting house the night before, my hope is dead. They killed Jesus on the cross. And then I preached the words of the angel to the women. He's not here. He's risen. (laughs) It was as though a jolt of electricity went through the hundreds seated, listening so intently to every word. There was a a sucking in of their breath. You could audibly hear him go, "Ah!" he's risen. They'd never heard that before. And one man just said, well, that's true. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. (laughs) You think he's saved? See, that's the response. Thank you. My Savior's alive. He's not dead on a cross. He is alive. 
And the emotion of Easter took full control of the group. It was out of control. We didn't have any more control. It was gone. There was such great joy in worship. So many just couldn't stop smiling. Most of them just sat there just with a grin on their face. Because they were saved. There were tears too, but no longer tears of mourning, but rather the thrill of joy erupted into manifest tears. And Jesus was alive. Their hope rose from the dead. They had never heard anything like it, and there was an overwhelming sense of relief as they contemplated that promised one was alive. Now remember, the Taliabo people had a theme in their culture. They were looking for eternal life. They did not bury their dead. They allowed the flesh to rot off their bones and then they would clean the bones and they put them in a usury, which they would keep, it's a box, all the bones of the deceased one, and they put it up in their houses hoping that they would come to life again sometime. Nobody ever did. Jesus Christ did. So you've got to keep that in mind. They marveled at God's epic story and some literally trembled and shook with emotion of their first Easter as we shared the rest of the story with them. And one by one, over a hundred Taliabo, like Mary Magdalene of old, heard their Lord say their name, and they believed. They believed. And had Jesus been there physically, I'm certain they would have fallen at his feet and just clung to him like Mary did. They felt something, people. They felt the overwhelming sense of well-being, of being forgiven for their sins. This is the emotion of Easter. I don't know how often it's talked about, but by the grace of God, Mary and I and a couple other Americans were able to witness it. And it's like, why us, Lord? Oh my gosh. Is your heart overflowing with such vibrant, exuberant worship as you consider the resurrection of Jesus Christ today? Can you join with Mary Magdalene and the disciples and the Taliabo with exultant praise this morning? You know, maybe you're hearing this stuff for the first time like the Taliabo. I mean, you've heard about Jesus, and you've heard about the Bible, and you've heard about church, and maybe you've gone to church a lot of times, but maybe this is the first time you've heard that you have to personally receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You know what? You don't have to come up here and walk up an aisle. You don't have to sign anything. You can do that in the quietness of your heart right now and just say, I've never heard about this. I know I'm a sinner. I need my sins forgiven. Jesus, please save me. And if you're sincere, this will be the best Easter you've ever experienced in your entire life. Or maybe you're a Christian and you have believed. You know you're a believer, but you've lost the joy. That first love has kind of grown cold in your life. There's a number of reasons, mostly because of sin, because you're willfully sinning against things that you know you shouldn't be doing. And so consequently, you don't have that emotion. You don't have that joy. You're just looking forward to the ham dinner. That's sad, beloved, if you're a believer. Because he died for you so that you could have joy overflowing. And because of your own willful sin, you're, you're quenching the spirit in your life and you don't have that joy. Just confess it. Just tell him, I'm sorry, Jesus. Don't try and figure it all out. Just tell him, I'm sorry. I want that joy to come back into my life. Do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Work in my life, Lord, like you did at the beginning. He'll do that. If you're sincere. And those of you that are joyful, say hallelujah with me. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. Have a marvelous Resurrection Sunday.